you know what these are? These are grains of barley. Now you might wonder what barley has to do with measurement tools. But the fact is that centuries ago, three grains of barley lined up about like this. Here we go. Was a basic unit of measurement. A unit of measurement we still use today. That's right. Three grains of barley used to be the definition of an inch. And you can see that it comes pretty close to our modern inch. Another unit of measurement with an interesting history is the foot. Nowadays, we know that a foot is 12 inches, the length of this rule. But centuries ago, a foot was just that, the length of a man's foot, usually the king's. Of course, that led to some problems because every time a new king came to the throne, the definition of a foot changed. The old way of measuring inches and feet might have worked fine back when there wasn't much need to be precise. But modern science and technology has changed all that. Today, so much industrial equipment is precisely machined that accurate measurements within thousands, even tens of thousands, are essential. And for measurements this small and precise, barley grains and bare feet just don't make it. What's needed then are two things. First, a set of standard units of measurement which are accurate and which everyone can recognize. And second, a variety of measurement tools that are extremely precise and relatively easy to use. Measurement tools like these are common in almost all industrial situations, and learning how to use them is an important part of your job. Remember, though, that units of measurement and measurement tools are only as accurate as the person doing the actual measuring. So sharpen your eye and watch carefully, because precision depends on you. Before we look at any measurement tools or attempt to measure anything, we have to understand what's meant by units of measurement. Basically, a unit of measurement is a standard unit that can be used to determine the dimensions of something. In measuring time, for example, we use minutes, hours, days, and so on. In measuring weight, we use ounces, pounds, grams, and kilograms, just to name a few. Throughout most of this unit, we'll be taking linear measurements, measurements of distance along a straight line. So we'll be using units of linear measure, such as inches, feet, centimeters, and meters. The first question we should answer is, why have units of measurement? Couldn't we do just as well without them? Well, let's see. Hello, Hank? Yeah. Could you send me a couple of bolts up about uh, this long? What? I said a couple of bolts about this long. Well, now you can see what the problem is. Without using units of measurement, I can't communicate the dimensions of the bolts I need. But if I'd said, bring me two half-inch bolts, three inches long, Hank would have known exactly what I wanted. So, units of measurement are primarily a way of communicating dimensions to one another. But this raises another question. How do I know that the inch on my rule is exactly the same length as the inch on Hank's rule? Well, in 1875, representatives from 20 nations met at the International Bureau of Weights and Measures in France. Their objective was to establish one unit of measurement that would be the basis of all other units of measurement all over the world. The unit they established was the meter, and a platinum iridium bar, precisely one meter long, became the international standard of linear measurement. Today, the original meter bar remains locked in a special vault in France, 
but exact copies have been distributed to many countries. Still, metal bars are subject to change, no matter how carefully they're protected. So in 1960, the meter was redefined. By studying and measuring the wavelength of light given off by special Krypton-86 lamps, scientists were able to define the meter in terms of wavelengths that never change. As a result, the meter is now officially defined as 1,650,763 0.73 wavelengths of Krypton-86. In addition to Krypton wavelengths, lasers are also used to define units of measurement, giving us standards that are much more reliable than the original meter bar. Of course, you won't use wavelengths or lasers to take measurements in your job, but knowing how much trouble scientists and others have gone to to establish a standard measurement system gives you some idea of how important precision is in today's world. As you probably know already, there are actually two systems of measurement used today. One is the English system, which uses inches, feet, and yards as its units. The other is the metric system, which uses the millimeter, centimeter, and meter, and is actually more common than the English system. Both systems are based on the same standard, the international meter, so measurements taken in the English system can be accurately converted into metric units and vice versa. In this program, we'll be using the English system, but depending on where the equipment you'll be working on was manufactured, you may find yourself having to use the metric system or having to convert English measurements to the metric system and vice versa. You'll find tables of English and metric units, as well as the rules for converting from one system to the other in your text. Look up that information right now. After studying it, you'll be ready to look at various measurement tools and learn how they're used and cared for. In the first segment, we saw what's meant by units of measurement. And we pointed out that there are two major systems of measurement, the English system and the metric system. It's important that you keep those units of measurement in mind, because now we're ready to start using them. Basically, there are two types of measurements, coarse measurements and precision measurements. Coarse or rough measurements are measurements that are accurate generally to hundredths of an inch. Precision measurements, on the other hand, are accurate to thousandths, ten thousandths, in some cases, even millionths of an inch. In this unit, we'll deal with coarse measurements and coarse measurement tools like these. And the most basic coarse measurement tool is this one, the rule. This rule happens to be one foot or 12 inches long and made of wood, but they're available in a variety of sizes and materials like this uh, six inch plastic rule and this 15 inch steel one. Now the best rules have more than one measuring edge or scale. For example, along one edge of this rule, the inches are divided into eight parts, one eighth of an inch apart. Along the other edge, the inches are divided into sixteenths. On the other side of the rule, we have inches divided into 32 parts along one edge and 64 parts along the other. So using this rule, you can measure anything from six inches all the way down to the nearest 64th of an inch. If your measurement has to be in metric units instead of English units, you can use a metric rule or a rule like this one that has both English and metric scales on it. This rule has inches divided into sixteenths along this edge and centimeters along this one. The centimeters are numbered and each centimeter is divided into 10 millimeters. Just remember that there are many different types of rules and when you select one to use, select one that will give you the measurement that you want, whether it's hundredths of an inch, millimeters, or whatever. Okay then, let's try measuring something. Uh, how about this piece of flat stock? Huh? 
Now, there are four important procedures you have to follow if your measurements are going to be accurate. First, be certain that the work you are measuring is clean. Now, dirt, corrosion, and bits of foreign matter on the work surface can affect the accuracy of your measurements. Dirt along an end, for example, can add length to the measurement, and foreign matter on the surface can prevent the rule from lying flat. So always take a minute or so to clean off the work. The effort will pay off in accuracy. Now the second procedure is to check the condition of the rule you're using. The edges and especially the ends should be smooth and even. A worn or damaged end will throw off your measurements. Also, the rule should lie flat and the marks on the rule should be legible. Third, when taking a measurement, be certain to correctly line up the rule and the work. The end of the rule should be flush with the end of whatever you're measuring. And the rule should be parallel to the length you're measuring. There, that looks about right. Check the alignment with your hand and your eye. Remember that both vision and a sense of touch are important for taking accurate measurements. And notice that when I check the rule, I look straight down on it. If I looked at it from an angle, I wouldn't see how well the end of the rule and the end of the stock match up. Finally, the fourth thing to be sure of is to read the rule correctly. Again, I sight straight down over the edge of the surface so I can see exactly where the rule and the edge line up. And I find that the length is 7 and 6 eighths inches. Since 6 eighths is an awkward fraction, I can reduce it uh, to 7 and 3 quarters. Always reduce your fractions to the lowest possible terms. It makes them easier to work with. Basically, that covers how to use a rule to measure rather short lengths. But what if you wanted to uh, measure the length of a room? Or, uh, or even this uh, tabletop? Do you have to make two or more small measurements from one end of it to the other? No, you don't. Instead, you would use one of these measurement tools, the folding rule or the tape rule. Now, the folding rule is really a series of short rules connected by movable joints. As you see, they open into a long, straight rule, usually between two and six feet long. The folding rule is used the same way a rigid rule is, following the same four rules we saw a moment ago. First, be certain that the work is clean. Second, inspect the rule carefully. Now, with folding rules, this means not only checking the ends and the edges, but also the joints. You see, one of the drawbacks to folding rules is that after a lot of use, the joints sometimes work themselves loose and affect the accuracy of measurements. So add these joints to your checklist when inspecting folding rules. They should lock in place without any play or looseness. The third rule is to correctly line up the rule on the work with your eye and your finger. Check the, that the ends are flush and that the rule runs parallel to the length that you're measuring, like so. And finally, sight straight down over the rule and the edge of the work to take your reading. The same four procedures apply to the tape rule as well. Put this away. Of course, when inspecting a tape rule, you don't have any joints to check because the tape is one continuous band but most tape rules have a hook or loop at the end. The hook helps you align the end of the tape with the end of the object being measured. It also holds the tape in position while you measure. Of course, you still have to be careful that the tape lies flat and that it's parallel to the surface being measured and that you read it by sighting straight down over the edge of the work. 
Now, in addition to being one continuous band and having a positioning hook or loop on the end, there are two other important advantages of tape rules, storage and variety. When you're finished measuring with this spring wind type, you simply press the button and the spring retracts the tape into its case. But always guide the last few inches of the tape into the case by hand. Allowing the tape to snap back into its case is a good way to break off the end hook and kink or even break the tape. Tape storage is also easy with this crank wine tape rule. When you're finished with it, just turn the crank clockwise and the tape will retract into its case. But again, be careful. Winding the crank counterclockwise can easily kink or break the tape. Tape rules are available in a variety of lengths. Unlike rigid rules that are limited to about six feet, tape rules can be hundreds of feet long. This makes them extremely versatile course measurement tools. This spring wind model is 10 feet long. This crank wind type is 50 feet long, but their length isn't their only difference. The shorter tape is curved or bowed along its length. This enables the tape to remain rigid while measuring short distances. To protect that curve in the tape, make it a rule never to bend or twist the tape. And when measuring a distance across open space, have someone give you a hand to prevent the tape from sagging. Sagging can not only weaken a curved cross section, but also affect the accuracy of your measurement. Longer tape rules, like this one, are designed to measure long dimensions, so they aren't curved to keep them rigid. Longer tapes are flat. This means that they're even more flexible than their shorter cousins. So when measuring with a long tape, be especially careful to guard against sagging. Keep that tape straight and parallel to the surface being measured. So far, we've seen how to measure flat surfaces and outside dimensions with rules and tape rules. But what do you do if you're asked to measure the inside dimension of something like this? This length here. Well, one way of measuring it is to use a folding rule like this one. This rule has a six inch extension on its first section. The extension can be adjusted back and forth to get an accurate inside measurement. Now, assuming that the work is clean and you've inspected the condition of the rule, all you do is open the rule to the approximate dimension and set it in place. Hold the end firmly against the starting point and adjust the extension until the other end of the rule touches the end point. To get the total measurement, simply add the reading at the end of the rule, over here, to the amount of the extension used. Okay. In this example, then, we add 14 inches, which is the length here, to the length of the extension which is four inches, and we get a total measurement of 18 inches. A second means of measuring an inside dimension is to use a tape rule. Now you have to be careful which tape rule you use. The hook on the end of this one retracts slightly when it's pressed against a surface, guaranteeing that the end of the tape lies flush against the starting point. But not all tapes have retractable hooks. On some, the hook is stationary. On others, there is a loop instead of a hook. So when measuring an inside dimension, be certain that the end of the tape you're using can be pressed flat against the starting point. Measuring inside dimensions is also made easier by the fact that on many tape rules, the case is a certain number of inches long. For example, this case is two inches long. So, in measuring an inside dimension, all we do is to hold the hook end against one wall, like so, 
and the back edge of the case against the other wall. Now by locking it into place and making sure, of course, that it's parallel and sighting directly down over the front end edge of the case, we can take a reading. All right, that appears to be 16. Then we add to the reading on the tape, which was 16, the two inches covered by the case, and the answer is 18, which matches the measurement taken with the folding rule. That takes care of flat inside dimensions. But uh, how about taking measurements of pipe and round stock? Well, measuring the diameter is no real problem. To measure the inside diameter, for example, we can lay a rule along the top with its end butted against the inside wall of the pipe, like so. Now, the trick in measuring diameters is to be sure you measure the pipe at its widest part. So move the rule back and forth a bit to find the widest part of the pipe. Then sight right down across the rule, straight down, and take your reading. For outside diameters, follow the same procedure, but use the outside wall of the pipe as your starting and ending points. Now, uh, measuring the length of a piece of pipe is simple, too. Just use your tape rule. Hook its end to the end of the pipe just as you would when taking a flat measurement and extend the tape far enough to take the measurement. To be certain the ends of the pipe are cut squarely, you'll need to take two or more measurements and then compare them. If all the measurements are the same, you know the ends are square. Okay, so far we've measured the diameter of a pipe and the length of the pipe. What about its circumference? The distance around the pipe. Well, we need a coarse measurement tool that can wrap around the pipe, and that means a tape rule. But which one? This one. Even though the distance around the pipe is short, we'd use this longer tape. That's because this tape is flat. The shorter tape, as you'll remember, is curved to make it rigid. Wrapping the curved tape around the pipe would weaken the curve. Besides, the curve would prevent us from getting an accurate reading. So we use the flat tape. Leaving ourselves enough tape rule to hold on to, we wrap it carefully around the pipe until it joins itself, forming a loop. Now, there are two important points to remember here. First, make sure the tape loop is as perpendicular as possible to the length of the pipe. Running the tape like this throws your measurements all out of whack. So run the loop perpendicular, as close as possible to perpendicular, to the length. Second, select a starting point for your measurement. In this case, I'm using the first two inches of the tape as a handle. So my measurement begins at the two inch mark. And when I take my reading, I look for the mark that lines up with that two inch line. You can see that the, oh, that looks like, uh, one foot and about one and an eighth inch mark lines up with it. Okay. Now, I simply subtract the two inches used as a handle from the measurement that I took, and I come up with the total measurement of 11 and 1 8 inches. Okay, now we've seen uh, 
flat surfaces and round surfaces, inside dimensions and outside dimensions. Is there anything else a rule can be used to measure? How about the depth of this hole? Well, one way would be to set a rigid rule or tape down into the hole and then try to take a reading by sighting along the lip of the hole. But a more accurate reading is obtained by using a depth rule. A depth rule is a rule with a perpendicular cross piece which slides up and down along the rule to adjust to the depth of the hole. Before measuring with the depth rule, be certain that the hole, especially the bottom of the hole where the rule will touch, is clear of dirt and other foreign matter. And of course, check the condition of the tool. As with other types of rules, the ends, especially the lower end, should be smooth and flat. Also, the cross piece should be firmly attached. If you wiggle it, and it moves from side to side on the rule, get another depth rule to use. And to measure with the depth rule, raise the cross piece to near the top of the rule. Set the rule with its end flat against the bottom of the hole. Then lower the cross piece until it lies flat across the lip. When you're certain that the rule extends straight down and is flush against the bottom, Lock it in place with this locking net back here. Remove it and take a reading at this point on the cross piece. According to this depth rule, the hole is one and three quarter inches deep. That pretty well covers the types of rules you'll be using and the way to use them correctly. There are other types of rules, but they operate on the same basic principle. With experience, you'll soon handle each of them comfortably and accurately and be able to choose the right rule for the job. But there are some course measurements that rules cannot make, at least not easily. For example, what tool would you use to measure the length of the bore of this impeller if there were a shaft running through it? We'll answer that question in the next segment. Right now, turn off the tape and work through section two of your text. The rules we looked at in the last segment are pretty versatile. We saw that they can measure flat surfaces, certain inside and outside dimensions, the depth of holes, even the diameters and circumferences of pipe or round stock. But there are some jobs rules can't do. As I mentioned before, you can't very well measure the length of the bore of this impeller, when the shaft is in place, that is, with a rule. And even though a rule can measure the diameter of, uh, oh, a pipe like this one, when at least one end is open, once that pipe is connected, a rule can't be used to take a direct measurement of the diameter. What we need then are coarse measurement tools especially designed to measure thicknesses and diameters quickly and easily. These are the tools we need. Simple calipers. Even though there are several different calipers here, we can divide them into two categories. Outside calipers, which have legs that curve inward, and inside calipers, which have legs that curve outward. As their names imply, outside calipers measure outside dimensions and inside calipers measure inside dimensions. Before we look at how simple outside and inside calipers are used, I have one piece of advice and one warning. The advice is always inspect a caliper before using it. Be certain the joint isn't loose. It should be just tight enough so that it can't slip once the legs have been set in position. Inspect the tips to be sure they're in good shape. If they're broken or chewed up, you're not going to be able to take accurate measurements. And my warning is, don't ever use calipers or any measurement tool 
on rotating parts. Trying to take measurements on running equipment can not only ruin the measurement tool you're using, but also pull the tool out of your hand and send it off like a missile to cause damage or injury. So always shut the equipment down before taking any measurements. Now that you know to inspect a caliper before using it and keep it away from rotating parts, let's see how calipers are used. We'll start with outside calipers, like this one. This is a firm joint outside caliper. It's called firm joint because the legs are held together at the top by a pin or rivet. Adjusting the legs is done by simply opening and closing them, like this. Okay, let's see how a firm joint cal outside caliper is used to measure an outside diameter. The mechanic first cleans the surface to be measured. Here, he's using penetrating oil and a clean rag to remove any dirt, grit, or corrosion that can affect the accuracy of measurement. Next, he adjusts the caliper so that the distance between the tips is slightly less than the diameter he's measuring. By slowly drawing the caliper across the work and rocking it slightly, he forces the legs to open, clearing the widest part of the hub, which is the measurement he wants. Then, by using a rule, he measures the distance between the tips to get a coarse measurement of the diameter. After taking this first measurement, he repeats the procedure to check his accuracy, making sure the tips of the legs drag slightly across the widest part of the hub. From what we just saw, we can learn three things about measuring with simple calipers. First, while measuring, the tips of the legs must be directly opposite each other on the surface. If one is higher or lower than the other, you won't get a true measurement of the thickness or diameter. Second, the caliper must be pulled across the surface so that it drags across the widest part. You have to rely on your sense of touch to feel the drag because if the tips don't drag across the widest part, your measurement won't be accurate. And third, when taking a reading, be certain one tip is right on the end of the rule, like so. And look directly down on the other tip. Looking across the second tip in an angle is one sure way to get an inaccurate reading. These three rules, keeping the tips directly opposite one another, allowing the tips to drag across the surface, and properly lining up the tips on the scale are not for outside calipers only. They apply to all calipers. This inside caliper, for example, its legs curve outward, allowing you to measure inside diameters. This one also has a spring joint and an adjusting screw. The legs are opened by turning the screw one way and closed by turning the screw the other. To close and open them large distances, the legs can be squeezed together and the adjusting mechanism set anywhere along the length of the screw. Even though this inside caliper is quite different from the outside caliper we saw a moment ago, the same three rules hold when taking a measurement. First, the mechanic adjusts the legs of the calipers so that the distance between them is slightly smaller than the inside diameter he's measuring. He then inserts the caliper into the work and adjusts the legs to match the size of the bore. Using his sense of touch, he rocks the caliper back and forth and side to side to locate the true diameter, which is the measurement he wants. Notice that he uses his finger to align the tip of the caliper with the end of the rule. Then he repeats the procedure to be certain his measurement is accurate. Again, he's careful to keep the tips directly opposite one another, and he feels for the right amount of drag between the tips and the work. When he takes a reading, he sights straight down across the tip and scale. Looks easy, huh? But when using inside calipers to take a measurement, there are three things to be careful of. First, be certain the work is clean and smooth. 
free of any burrs and irregularities that could throw your measurement off. Second, don't allow the caliper to seat itself in any ridges on the inside surface you're measuring. Otherwise, you'll be measuring ridges instead of the true diameter. And third, be sure to locate the true diameter. Rock the caliper back and forth and side to side until you know you found the widest part. One good technique to use is to place one tip deeper into the bore than the other tip. Then move the caliper until the lower tip passes the other one and you can feel the right amount of drag. So far then, we've seen both inside and outside calipers and how they're used. We also saw the difference between firm joint calipers and spring joint calipers. But we still haven't solved the mystery of the bore of this impeller. How would you measure the length of the bore, the distance from here to here, if a shaft was in place? An outside caliper seems like a good choice. Let's try it. Let's get our impeller firmed up here. So far, so good. The outside caliper can get the measurement all right, but how do we remove the caliper to take a reading on the rule? Obviously, this isn't the tool we need. The tool for this job is the transfer caliper. The transfer calipers have a small slotted leaf attached to the joint. A lock nut holds it securely in position against the leg. Let's see how this leaf solves the problem. The mechanic begins by loosening the main locking nut at the joint of the caliper. This allows both the legs and leaf to move freely. He then sets the caliper in place on the work just as he would if he were using an ordinary outside caliper. Once he has his measurement, he tightens the main lock nut just enough to hold the auxiliary leaf in position. After double checking for the right drag, he loosens the nut that holds the leaf to the leg. Now he can remove the caliper from the work, since the auxiliary leaf is retaining the correct measurement. By locking the leg back into position on the auxiliary leaf, he can take an accurate reading on the rule. You can see then that a transfer caliper is a pretty handy measurement tool. It enables you to get measurements that would otherwise require much more time and calculation. Now, all the calipers we've seen so far have had to be used with a rule in order for us to get a measurement. If you think about it, for many measurements, it would be a lot more convenient if the caliper and the rule were both in one measurement tool. That's what this is. It's a slide caliper, and it's actually a combination caliper and rule. You can see the two jaws that make the measurements. One is fixed, and the other is attached to the rule in such a way that it can slide back and forth along the scale. To hold the sliding jaw in place, once you've taken a measurement, there's a lock nut here. If you look very closely, you'll see that there are two lines and two words on the sliding jaw. The first line is labeled out, the second line in. What do out and in mean? Well, let's take a couple of measurements and see. Let's use a hub again. I'll start with the outside diameter. I make sure that the jaws are directly opposite one another on the end of the hub. And I adjust the sliding jaw so that when I rock the caliper back and forth, I can feel drag between the jaws and the work. Then I tighten the lock nut and take my measurement. What I just measured was the outside diameter, so I take my reading on the out line. The reading here is two and a half inches. Now, to measure an inside diameter, I loosen the locking screw 
and adjust the jaws so that the nibs at the tips of the jaws fit inside the hub. I get the measurement the same way I would with a simple inside caliper, rocking the tool back and forth and up and down to find the true diameter. Then I lock the sliding jaw in place and take my reading. This time I use the inline because I'm measuring an inside dimension. The reading here is one and two thirds inches. So you see, when I told you that a slide caliper is a caliper and a rule, I wasn't completely truthful. It's actually two calipers and a rule because it can measure both inside and outside dimensions. Just be certain when reading the scale that you read it at the right line. The inline for inside dimensions, the outline for outside dimensions. This completes our discussions about simple calipers. So far then, we've seen rules and calipers and how they're used to give coarse linear measurements. But not all coarse measurements are linear. So in the next segment, we'll look at a coarse measurement tool that does not take linear measurements, a tool that measures a particular kind of force. So far, all the course measurement tools we've seen have measured distance. Rules and tapes measure lengths, calipers measure thicknesses and diameters. This torque wrench, though, measures something completely different, torque. Torque is turning or twisting force. And as you may already know, on some equipment, threaded fasteners like bolts, nuts and studs must be tightened with a specific amount of torque. Tightening fasteners and other parts with the exact amount of torque specified by the manufacturer helps to ensure that the equipment can handle the various stresses that occur during operation. Just as length is measured in feet and inches in the English system, so torque is measured in units called foot-pounds. So when you look up the torque values for a piece of equipment you're working on, you'll find the required torque stated in foot-pounds. When working with a torque wrench, there are two important considerations. The amount of force that should be applied to each fastener and the pattern to follow in tightening the fasteners. We'll be tightening the bolts in this pump casing. So our first step is to check the manufacturer's instruction manual for information on torque values and tightening patterns. The manufacturer requires 15 foot-pounds of torque and an opposite bolt tightening pattern. The torque wrench we'll use is a deflecting beam type. It has an indicator on the handle that registers the amount of torque being applied. We can tell by the indicator that this wrench has a range of between 0 and 25 foot-pounds. Since 15 foot-pounds falls into about the middle of that range, I know that this wrench is right for the job. Selecting a wrench that has the torque value you need in the middle of its range ensures that you won't strain the tool and perhaps damage it. When inspecting this wrench, we check the drive mechanism to be certain it's in good shape. We also check the handle and the indicating beam, making sure they're not bent or otherwise damaged. The bolts in the casing have 15 sixteenths of an inch heads. So we select a 15 sixteenths of an inch socket and attach it to the wrench. Then, following the diagram in the manual, we tighten the first bolt. Notice that I keep my arm perpendicular to the handle. I also use a smooth, continuous motion and stop tightening when the gauge indicates 15 foot-pounds, the manufacturer's specification. Then I go on to the next bolt, the one directly opposite the first one. Following the tightening pattern ensures that the casing halves join evenly. 
Then the third bolt. Again, my arm is perpendicular to the handle and I use a smooth, continuous motion. Also, I look straight down on the indicator to read it. Otherwise, I couldn't be sure of an accurate reading. Then the fourth bolt. And so on, until the bolts have been tightened with 15 foot-pounds of torque. That shows how to use a deflecting beam torque wrench, but there are other types. This one, for example, is a dial indicating torque wrench. It gives a reading on a dial instead of a plate mounted on the handle. And this type is a micrometer setting torque wrench. When using this one, simply set the release mechanism for the amount of torque you want to apply. Then, when you tighten the fastener, the wrench will release automatically when the right amount of torque is reached. But no matter which type of torque wrench you use, there are four basic rules to follow. First, before tightening any fastener, check the manufacturer's instruction manual for the proper torque value and tightening pattern. Second, never attach a length of pipe or other cheater to the handle of the wrench. Putting an extension on the handle multiplies the force applied and could damage both the fastener and the wrench. If the fasteners you're tightening are difficult to reach, use a torque wrench that's designed for use with an extension and use only the extension designed for the wrench. Third, never use a torque wrench to break bolts or nuts free. These wrenches aren't designed for that purpose and using them that way could throw off their accuracy. And finally, don't use a torque wrench to test a bolt or nut that's already been tightened. The readings you get won't be accurate. If you want to check the torque of a bolt that's already been tightened, use a regular wrench to break it free. Then use the torque wrench to retighten it correctly. Torque wrenches are important course measurement tools because their function is important. Using them properly enables equipment to handle operational stresses. Using them improperly can lead to equipment damage and malfunctions. So treat torque wrenches with the same care you use in handling and storing your other tools. After use, wipe them with a lightly oiled rag to protect them against corrosion. And store them where they won't get banged around or end up at the bottom of a tool pile. There are other precautions to follow when handling and storing course measurement tools. We'll see some of them in the next segment. One thing we've emphasized about taking course measurements is that measurements will be accurate only if the tools used are in good condition. A rule with a chewed up end or a caliper with a bent leg is practically worthless. In addition, some course measurement tools, especially calipers, are expensive. It's much more economical to keep the tools you have in good condition than to replace damaged ones. So let's spend a few minutes on the care of course measurement tools. As we'll see, most rules for proper care are largely common sense. Basically, measurement tools can be damaged in three ways. Using them improperly, storing them improperly, and in the case of metal tools, allowing them to rust or corrode. To protect rules like this one, use them only for the purpose they were designed, to measure along straight lines. Don't use a rule as a screwdriver or a pry bar and don't bend or twist a rigid rule around corners and curved surfaces. You'll end up putting permanent bends or kinks in it. And it won't lie flat when you try to measure a flat surface. The same applies to folding rules. Don't flex them or use them for anything besides measuring. And open and close a folding rule gently. The joints between the sections will last a lot longer that way. If you're measuring a curved surface, like the circumference of a pipe or cylinder, use a flat tape rule. That's what flat tape rules are for. As I mentioned earlier, 
Don't try to use a tape with a curved cross section, like this one. Wrapping a short tape around a pipe will weaken the curve. When retracting a spring wind tape into its case, do it gently. Guide the last few inches into the case to prevent damaging the tape or the hook at the end. And when cranking a long tape rule, be certain you crank in the right direction, clockwise. Cranking the wrong way can kink or break the tape. The parts of simple calipers and slide calipers that require special attention are the tips or jaws. Don't use a simple caliper as a scraper or a punch or anything else because once the legs of a caliper are severely damaged, there's nothing that can be done to repair them. Minor wear and corrosion on the tips can be corrected by filing the tips down to keep them sharp. But don't remove too much metal. You don't want to shorten the legs or make the tips so thin that they're too delicate to use. Except to clean foreign matter off them, you don't want to fool around with the jaws of a slide caliper. Even filing the slightest amount of metal from the jaws will throw off the scales and give you inaccurate readings. You don't have to worry about filing damaged ends or removing rust from your metal tools if you store them properly and protect them against corrosion. The first mistake to avoid is storing your measurement tools with your other hand tools. Simply dropping rules, tape rules, and calipers in the same toolbox as your hammers, wrenches, and screwdrivers is one sure way to have your measurement tools banged around and damaged. If possible, keep measurement tools out of the pile by storing them in their own toolbox. Store rigid rules and calipers flat and arrange all your tools so that they don't shift position every time the toolbox is moved. Of course, plastic and wooden rules and cloth tape rules can't rust, but metal tools can. To protect them, wipe them with a clean, lightly oiled rag after each use. A light film of oil keeps air and dirt off the surface of the tool, but don't put too thick a coat of oil on your tools. A heavy coat of oil is a dirt and grit collector. It's particularly important to keep dirt and grit out of joints and moving parts. Grit trapped in a caliper joint will act like file teeth wearing down the metal. Friction can also cause excessive wear, so it's important that caliper joints and other moving parts be lubricated occasionally. But be careful, too much lubrication on simple cali calipers can make the joint so slippery that it can't hold a measurement. In all cases, the best rule is to follow the tool manufacturer's recommendation when it comes to lubrication. Well, that just about covers the basic points of tool care. You'll find that if you use measurement tools properly, store them properly, and protect them from dirt and corrosion, they'll give you years of reliable service. After all, Measurement tools are a big part of your job. In many cases, they make the difference between doing a job right and making costly errors. The few minutes a day you spend caring for your tools is a small payment for the advantages measurement tools give.